Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Quantum Action Podcast, where we're here to take you to infinity and beyond. And today I've got Kevin Kelly with me, who's a futurist, and he's got a new book um, coming out very shortly. And uh, Kevin's going to talk to us about his new book and about uh, the future. Kevin, welcome to the show. It's my privilege and pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So, Kevin, tell us all about your new book. This is a bit of a different book to, to the other ones you've written, where, where you've written more uh, about futurism than that. So tell us about this new book and, and how come you decided to write this. Yes. Well, thank you for asking. Um, yeah, the new book is a little book um, called Excellent Advice for Living, and there are about 450 little tiny tweetable bits of proverbs, um, wisdom, adages, maxims, just um, things to remind us of good behavior, living the right life, how to grow personally, um, how to be the best you. And um, I subtitled it, Wisdom I Wished I Had Known Earlier, because um, a lot of these things were kind of hard learned. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to kind of learn them, and um, I find that having uh, this kind of knowledge distilled down into a tweetable form helps me remember it in my own life and recall it, and bringing those things back mm -hmm. into mind are very, very useful. So, um, so what motivated you to write this book and, and uh, compared to the you – know, it's a different yeah. style of book to the ones you've written in the past. It was an inadvertent book. It began as um, me uh, reaching near 70, jotting down some ideas for my kids yep. as a present on my birthday. Yep. And um, I wrote a few down. I, I, I'd never done it before. I'm not really um, uh, a preachy person. And uh, my our child-rearing parenting philosophy was much more um, watch what we do, not what we say. Yeah. And so um, we didn't say very much. We were trying to, to lead by actions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, which is, by the way, one of the bits of advice. And uh, mm -hmm. um, so this was a new thing. And once, but, but once I started writing things down, I found I had a lot to say, and I kept going. And mm -hmm. I put them out on the Internet in the first round, and they were very well received. People like to hear them as well. So mm -hmm. I decided to do more, and I kept making more every year. Mm -hmm. And eventually we decided we'd make it kind of hand handy for people to hand to another young person in the form of a book. Okay, good, good, good. So, and it's coming out in a few weeks, correct? Right, it'll be launching May 2nd in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it remains to be seen whether there'll be a um, UK edition of those, a Penguin book, so. So it's coming out, is it coming out in paperback or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it'll be hardcover. There'll be okay. a little, a little, Gifty hardcover version. Eventually, it'll be paperback, but originally, uh, it's going to be a hardcover. Okay, good, 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 great. And uh, and I guess you can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Yes, you can pre-order on Amazon right now. As a matter of fact. Okay, that's good, good. So, Kevin, um, we've been through this lockdowns. A lot has changed in the world over the last few years, um, and technology is you know rolling with AI um, and. Uh, other things, lots of talk about chat, chat GPT, how that's changing things. Um, lots of talk about citizen journalists, fake news, um, and technology is playing a big role in all these things. So uh, I'm sure we'll get to cover all those in the next couple of minutes. Yeah. So t t tell us more about these things. What's your view on all this technology and where do you think it's going to take us? And what can we do as individuals to benefit? So you're right. I, I think we're at this moment where... Um, even though some people, like myself, have been talking about this for decades, um, trying to get us ready, it seems like it's finally beginning. Um, and what is the it? The it is the arrival of this artificial intelligence, artificial smartness, artificial learning in our lives. And um, the thing that, uh, there were two, maybe two points I want to make. Mm -hmm. First, it's not a singular thing. It's not like the AI. Yeah. There are going to be thousands and thousands of varieties, and mm -hmm. they will all have their own different personalities and 
abilities and uses, like tools. Yeah. And um, it'll be increasingly difficult to generalize about them all because it's like talking about machines, all right? Well, some machines are tiny and simple and we love them and others are complicated and they frustrate us. And so there's lots, going to be lots of varieties of AI and artificial smartness, etc. And the second thing is that in most cases, um, the relationship that we're going to have with these is as partners. They aren't really going to replace people ever in your lifetime, my lifetime. They're going to be things that we use together and they hopefully make us better humans, but we're actually going to be working with them in all kinds of capacities. There may be some very rare occasions when they absolutely replace somebody, yep. but it's rare. And so far, we don't have any examples of anybody being fired because of an AI. So, so, so the it is this new tool that will help us be creative, will help us get work done, will help us um, make stuff, will help us do things, whether we're making physical things or intangible things like ideas and books and music. And um, we have, we'll have a partner, um, partners working with different capabilities. And mm -hmm. we've seen some of those first examples in this, past, this year of um, things that will help you make art, things that will um, help you write stuff. And um, things will help you make music. Yeah, that's uh, that's all, all all really really good. Uh, now, some people think, or some people are scared of AI. They reckon that AI could potentially take over. I mean, do you think AI could be dangerous? I mean, what's your view on on, on that? Well, I'm sure it's dangerous. There's mm -hmm. the more powerful a technology is the more powerfully it can be abused or go wrong. Uh, and this is by far the most powerful technology that we've ever made. So it is definitely a dangerous, there'll be uh, ways to make it dangerous. But we yeah. have all the incentives in the world mm -hmm. to prevent that. We don't want yeah. it to be dangerous, so we will work hard to make sure it's not dangerous. Yeah, well, what's your view on this? merging man with machine thing where some people are saying they want to put a microchip in their head so they can google stuff in their head and things like that do you think that's a good idea that we start tampering with our bodies and, and adding technology in, inside our, our brains and that i, I, I personally think that's, that's a little dangerous because it could create like two types of human beings the normal sure. human being and then the kind of superhuman being with the microchip right. in their head. so yeah um i'm i'll probably be one of the last people to put a chip in my brain However, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I have, I, I, I still have all my hips and ankles and stuff, but my brother doesn't, he's cyborgian already. Yeah. Um, my wife has, um, b uh, metal inside her. So we will be doing this slowly over time. Um, we're much more likely to kind of, um, try it on animals first. So, so by the time people are doing it, and they have some benefit. So it's kind of like everyone's going to watch the first person doing it yeah. and see, like, is it really better? How do you feel? Um, how do you feel long term? So if that person says, yeah, wow, man, I'm, you know, I can run, you know, I can do a four minute mile and I can solve Einstein's equations in my head without writing down. People are going to start, um, start using it and planting it. So the thing about that is that's way, way off. And there's no reason for you to, or anybody out there to be worried about it right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, over long term, but we have plenty of time to figure out how to do it safely. Yeah, I mean, well, what, I mean, one thing is having, you know, a, a hip replacement or a leg replaced with something like a bionic leg. But um, the thing that concerns me a little bit is when people want to enhance their brains by putting a computer in their head. Why does that, why does that concern you? Well, I mean, it concerns me because I mean, to what degree are this person going to be in control of their brain? How could it be that somebody could hack that chip and then make this person do something that they don't right. want to do? I so, mean, um, 
So if, it, if they were able to do that, then they, that's probably a bad thing. So we would prevent that from happening. Maybe it happens once and then you say, well, I don't really, who, who would want that? So everybody's going to try and make that not happen, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so the first, it happens once and then people say, I don't want that to happen again. And they put in encryption or whatever else. Yeah. Problem solved. Mm -hmm. And then now you have a chip and that makes you smarter. What's wrong with that? Oh, no, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just that, you know, it, it, it could be turned, turned around. Well, the, the fact that there are problems. See, here's the thing. Here's why I'm not worried about that. Okay. It's not because there's not going to be problems. The problems that are coming from AI, as I said, are going to be greater than the problems we've had so far. Okay. What's happening, though, is our ability to solve problems also increases even faster. Mm -hmm. So with AI, we have the ability to solve problems faster. Yeah. So it's not that there's not going to be a world of no problems. It's just that we can continue to accelerate yeah. in fixing problems. Yeah, which is going to be great because we're going to be able to develop new technologies. And, uh, and my, the, the next thing I wanted to ask you is about space travel. We see Elon Musk, who really is... I think you helping humankind big time uh, by pushing us into space um, with this new space race that's on now, which is no longer a space race between nations, but between companies. Um, we see Richard Branson up there with, with his Virgin Galactic. We see Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin and we see Elon Musk with SpaceX. And then there's a, another five, six, seven, eight companies out there. Bigelow Aerospace is one of them, for example, that are, are developing uh, ships to go into space and, and uh, to the moon in orbit and, and beyond. Um, what's your view on this new space race? Do you think it's going to take us to interesting places? Do you think it's going to ha happen anytime soon where we will become an off-planet or multi-planetary society? So we are in a space race which has been accelerated by the entry of private um, agents. But mm -hmm. um, the, the, they're still, I mean, there's China, which is mostly a state-run thing, and they're yeah. going to be increasingly important in this yeah. uh, exploration. And India. And, India. and India as well. Yeah. And NASA is not down. NASA has been invigorated and um, in some ways, um, you know, kind of uh, inspired by the private ones, and they're going to continue going. And so a lot of space is so expensive that it's unlikely Mm -hmm. for the states to disappear as a necessary part of this exploration. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where we are. Right now, we're, we're, we're figuring out, we're exploring. And if you look at sort of the economic models that would be necessary to sustain this over the long term, mm -hmm. um, there are some eco really great economic models for the near space, near orbit, industrialization. So you put up manufacturing, energy collection, beaming down concentrated energy, off-worlding um, industry as much as possible in near space, like on asteroids and, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, asteroid mining is a big Asteroid thing. mining and stuff. These are probably legitimate um, ideas that we can have an economic model for. Mm -hmm. And so there might be people living in near orbit space and hollowed out asteroids, etc. Um, the, there isn't really any economic model for going to Mars. And it's other than having a research station, um, it's unlikely that there's ever going to be anything beyond that in Mars. Well, I, uh, I, and I'm, I'm a bit critical to I mean, now. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to go into space. I'd love to go to other planets. And, and exploring that. But the whole Mars thing, I think the limitation we have, well, first of all, our technology, it takes quite a while to get there. It takes like three three months in, in the best case scenario, if not six months. Um, now, my question is, uh, and being being an airline pilot and, 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 and studied aircraft accidents and whatever, and knowing how important the human factor plays a role in, in, in accidents, uh, I'm thinking to myself, well, there you are. It's already bad enough if you're in a cockpit for 12 hours with someone you can't stand. What if you're in an aluminium tube and you're launched between here and Mars and it takes six months to get there? What's going to happen interaction wise between the human beings on that mission or on those missions? Um, are they going to be able to get, get along? 
um, because you you know and and bear in mind no one no human being is adventures that far away from earth and so psychologically how is that going to play i mean you can run as many computer models as you want but no one's going to know how the human being is going to react once the, the the spaceship is let's say three weeks away from earth and no one's been three weeks away from earth um how's that going to play psychologically on these astronauts um are they going to be able to keep keep cool head or not and there's no way of really measuring that i think that's the biggest challenge of all is is the yeah. human factor i think i think getting robots to mars to mine mars and whatever isn't going to be a problem but it's the humans getting the humans there and even once the humans get to mars um how are they going to react psychologically yeah no i agree i think um Space is not for um, humans, it's for machines. This, generally, that's the general rule. E yeah. Even asteroid mining mostly has to be robotic as much as possible. Um, and one of the points I make about Mars is that um, it's about a million times easier to build a city at the bottom of our ocean than it is to build a city on Mars. And how likely is it we're going to build a city on the bottom of the ocean? And... Um, it's this is no economic for it. Um, the same thing with Mars. That's setting aside the legitimate concern you have about um, long term, uh, you know, harmony, and more importantly, um, the drift of the reason why someone's doing it. This is one of the reasons why you know starships going over hundreds of years are very unlikely because people are going to. You know, the people who are being born on this, <laughs> no, no yeah. choice about this, and they're going to probably want to turn around and come back. So, um, so, so this, this issue of, um, of generational um, mission is completely uh, new to us and um, uh, something that we have to deal with. So I think that also means that it's a very slow process. But uh, for the near term, the, the, there's lots of reasons to keep putting up more satellites in space. Um, we have to be careful about filling it up with uh, junk so that we, we we could we could make a disaster. So you can't launch anything. Yeah. Um, but um, near term um, asteroid mining and energy generation seem like a reason to keep um, exploring in the near orbit area. So. Um, so I think that is a very exciting um, time, and but that's a century project. Yeah, I think that the, the traveling to other worlds that could be orbiting other star systems, I think that there's probably some other way of doing it. I mean, there's lots of talks of wormholes and portals and yeah. things like that, which is something that has been talked about. Some scientists have theorized sure. about it. Um, you only have to watch the, the show Ancient Aliens and they're saying all sorts of stuff like, oh, the pyramids were built by aliens that came through portals mm -hmm. and that. Who knows? Who knows? But um, I don't think that uh, space or, or the way we travel to the moon is the way, as humans, we're going to get to another planet. I think that there's probably another way. But I think the, the biggest problem for us right now is that I don't think we're mature enough. I think God up there probably reveals things to us when we're ready. Um, and technology wise, I don't think we're mature enough to be able to go out and adventure. I mean, let's say we found life on another planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. They found all these M class planets out there. I mean, there's thousands of them or millions of them now, uh, which means that the, the likelihood of other civilizations being out there is very, very high. Um, so what would we do if we were to travel to another world? I mean, we just have to look at the history of this planet and, and, and seeing what, what, what would... I mean, look at this situation with the Ukraine and Russia and everyone's trying to interfere and everybody has an opinion about it and that what we're going to do if we suddenly go out to other planets? Are we going to try and convert them to our way of living? Um, is, is that what you, what you do? Um, so I think we need to mature more as, 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 as people before we're going to be allowed to, to have access to that kind of technology. I think eventually it will come, uh, but I just think, I don't think we're ready. Well, most, most of mankind is not ready. We're too greedy, too selfish. What's, what's your view on that? Um, it's not something we have to worry about because we don't have the capabilities in, in, for a long time. So that's the restraining factor. Yep. Um, we, just, we just are incapable technologically to, to venture into stars. It's just not... 
something that we have to worry about right now. Yeah, I think we. I think the the advent now with with Starlink and and rolling out the internet to another two billion people over the next few years, where people will have their first cell phone, will have satellite capability, so it will work in the middle of the jungle, on the top of a mountain, in the middle of the desert. It's going to allow us to connect with each other a lot better, which is going to be good. Um, it's going to allow more business to happen. It's going to allow more people to meet more people and more minds to get together and develop stuff and develop technology and that. And I think that's going to be really, really important. Um, and I think that's going to be a good benefit for mankind as well. Uh, what's your view on this whole cell phone and, and how cell phones are connecting people now? I'm all for it. I think it's a great leap forward, connecting all the people on Earth. Um, it's been transformative to the to the poorest people on the planet. Farmers having access to watering supplies, to getting market prices for crops, being able to connect to health services. It's just fabulous, generally. There are some few downsides, but overall, it's an incredible step forward. And um, what we want to do is inc keep increasing the bandwidth to all the people, um, keep upgrading um, the capabilities of services. Now we have AI being brought into this internet, which is again, really fabulous because, you know, a human doctor is really great. And an AI doctor is maybe, is not as good as a human doctor, but an AI doctor is much better than no doctor. And so um, having, we have the prospect of, you know, having doctoring um, being done with AI and, and the mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. um, that's incredibly powerful. Yeah, because they, they were saying that what the AI doctor can do is can diagnose uh, things a lot quicker. So they can spot a cancer in somebody at a very, very early age and then immediately get rid of it. And so it, it certainly looks like this technology is going to allow man's lifespan to probably go from like, I think it's about 85 years old right now, to beyond 100. I think the next 20 to 30 years, the number of people going over, dying after 100 years old are going to increase exponentially because of technology. Um, we know more about food these days and how food affects people. We only have to look in sports and you see how, how many athletes now are breaking records that, ha that, that, that before people thought were impossible because they're training differently because there's so much more data now on the way people train and, and they're designing the training systems to improve human performance and they're looking at things like sleep um i mean there's a the famous uh, story of the british cyclist team which had never won anything and then this new coach arrived and he decided that they had to improve 20 things by one percent each and one of the things that they changed was the pillow that the cyclist slept on so they gave him a special type of pillow um, and then they changed the way they ate. They did a number of things, but it was small, small changes in, in 20 different areas. And the British cycling team went from winning nothing to winning everything. Uh, race after race, Olympics after Olympics. And, and so it was, and technology played a very, very important role in this. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to benefit uh, from this moving forward um, in, in the health arena, but also in, in, in other arenas as well, as you were saying, you know, it's just gonna help us to improve our minds um, and a lot of things that we, uh, for example, if you've got a, a garden and you're busy mowing the lawn, you won't have to worry about that anymore because you're going to have a robot that's going to do that. A robot will clean the house. A robot will mow the lawn. Um, well, before you'd have to hire a human being to do that. So now suddenly I freed up a lot of my time. And what am I going to do with that time? Uh, uh, and if I'm going to research something, I can research things a lot quicker now which means that in an hour, I could probably research 10 things instead of researching one thing. And so the quality of whatever I'm gonna produce, whether I'm writing a book or doing a podcast or producing a movie or a documentary, the quality is gonna be so much better. Um, think of archeologists, when archeologists dig things up, um, the, the AI will be able to help them to figure out what this artifact is and connect it to a series of other things. And say, oh, there were three artifacts like this found in the last six months. And one was found in Ecuador, one was found in Egypt, one was found in South Africa, and they're all very similar. Drrr, connect the dots. Something that before wasn't possible. Someone would discover something somewhere, dig it up, look at it, take it home, analyze it, and not know there's somebody 
halfway around the world that's dug up something very very similar but today with 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 the internet um you know there's more information out there which i think is going to be is going to be good but do you think having so much information is going to be dangerous for mankind do you think there could be a danger angle on there or not I'm going to repeat myself and say that the more powerful the technology is, the more powerful the problems are. This yeah. is a very powerful technology, so there are things that can make it dangerous. There are problems that it does create, but our ability to solve those problems also increases. And we're dealing with that right now with the issues of um, misinformation, um, how do you believe something, uh, even the AIs can generate things and whether we should believe what they say or and how we tell. So, um, so these are new things. Um, they may be uh, a problem right now, but we'll solve them. And the benefits um, still outweigh um, the negatives. Yeah, and I, and I think the main thing here is that as human beings, we need to stay creative and we need to think. Um, because when you hear all these different points of view out there, you need to have the ability to process what's being said and connect the dots. And I think that's where we need to focus is, is, is doing things that help us to expand our minds and connect the dots and not just someone said, it's a, that's black. Oh, wait a minute. How do we know it's black? Um, you know, process things, connect the dots. Don't believe everything we, we, we hear on television, for example. Um, I think the whole advent of citizen journalists is a really, really good thing where people can now just whip their phones out and film something and then post it on the internet. Uh, the advent of podcasting, for example, which is basically your own radio show, I think that's a great thing. And I think it's down to the consumer to decide what to watch, what to listen to, what to read. Uh, I'm of the opinion that everybody should have a voice. Everybody should be able to express their opinion. I don't think people should be censored. I think it's down to the listeners to decide what to listen to and what not to listen to and who to believe and who not to believe. I think that's where we are. Yeah. But I mean, this censorship that's been going on that now seems to be ending now with uh, Elon Musk, who's now bought Twitter and has kind of stopped the censoring there. And I think Facebook is now, and now the new trend is to no longer censor people, which is good. Um, and just let the people decide instead of trying to control what people are thinking. I think in order to progress as, as humankind, you know, we need to allow people to think. Um, and I think this is really, really important um, and connect the dots because that's the only way we're going to evolve. If you, they, they used to say once upon a time that if you, people didn't have information, if people were ignorant, they were easier to control. That's true. Uh, but I also think that if people have some moral and ethnic values, uh, like we were talking before, yes, AI can be used for bad thing, technology can be used for, 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 for bad things. But um, I think if people have got like a moral compass, they will know that, you know, that this power they have in their hands can be very, very good, but it can be also very, very bad. But their moral compass will tell them, do the good things with it. Don't do the bad things. And I think that's, uh, that's really, really key. I think, I think we have to also still embrace nature and still spend time away from technology um, to be grounded and still in contact with with the planet. There's so much that we don't know about our planet. I mean, just take the Amazon rainforest, for example. Only 2% of the plants in the Amazon rainforest are actually catalogued. So the other 90% of the plants, we don't know what properties they have. We don't know what they, they do. So there's lots of things that we can discover. Um, and a lot of the shamans in the, in the Amazon rainforest um, ha know what a lot of these other plants do. And this is kind of knowledge that we need to, you know, learn about. Um, but we need to spend time doing these things and, and, and spend time in nature observing, you know, the animals and things like that instead of going out and knocking forests down to build more oil rigs and things like that. There's a lot that we can learn um, by watching nature uh, and, and being in nature, you know, sitting on top of a mountain and just soaking in the view kind of thing instead of being on our phones. Uh, I think this is this is I think this is a bit of a challenge, particularly young people today. Um, they're very much into technology and and they don't know what's growing on the tree in their back garden. Right. So what, what, can, you, what can you tell me about, what advice would you give to, to, to young people today, a young person that's listening? Well, I have a book of advice for young people, excellent mm -hmm. advice 
for living. There's 450 little things. And you know, a suggestion would be like, um, you're only as young as the last time that you changed your mind. So you want to kind of keep changing your minds. Um, when someone tells you something is wrong, they're usually right. Mm -hmm. But when they tell you how to fix it, they're usually wrong. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, um, when you were young, have friends who are older, and when you were old, have friends who are younger. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, work to become, not to acquire. Mm -hmm. um, show me your calendar, and I will tell you your priorities, and sh tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you can avoid seeking approval of others, your power is limitless. Yeah, yep. all, all great advice, great advice. And this right. is why, and, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's nice that our conversation has come full circle and we're, and we're back to, to your, your new book with the advice there um, for young people and for everybody really um, moving forward. It's, it's really, really important that we take control of our lives. We are in control of our lives. There's a lot that we can do uh, in an age today with the way the technology, technology is going. It's just really going to allow us to go to infinity and beyond, which is the subtitle of the podcast, because um, there's so much more that we can achieve. And maybe we will solve this problem of space travel. Maybe we will manage to get from A to B a, a lot quicker without having to travel for six months to go to Mars. Maybe it will take us a few seconds in the future once we discover how. Um, but as I said before, I think the how will come when we are mature enough. Um, and so that I think that moral compass... To me, I think that's the key with all this technology. If we have a moral compass, then we're going to be all right. If we if we discard our moral compass, which I believe is is almost innate inside us, um, then then that's when when it could get dangerous. But I, I have faith in mankind. I think at the end of the day, most people are good people, um, and I think uh, at the end of the day, good will prevail against evil. Even though you know you switch the TV on these days, there's lots of bad things happening, but there's a lot of good things happening as well. Um, and I think that's where we need to focus our attention is on doing good or as you said being good and Focus on the being focus on the, 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 the development at the end of the day. We're human beings. We're not do human doings or human haves. We're human beings so the word being itself uh, Tells us why we're here. We're here to be not to have Kevin, it's been great uh, to have you here on the show and I'll put the link below to the link on Amazon to people can get your, your your book and your other books as well. You wrote about futurism. Thank you very much for being on Quantum Action. Those of you that are listening for the first time, subscribe, and we're here to take you to infinity and beyond, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.